I never really loved that restaurant experience, the kitchen life, the working till two in the morning, just kind of, I think a lot of the attitudes of the chefs working in restaurants. You know, I applied for jobs out of culinary school and was kind of turned off by the attitude of many of the hiring executive chefs. I just thought these guys sound kind of like jerks and I don't really want to work for them. Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Not every chef is working at a restaurant or a hotel. Many own food trucks or operate as private chefs. My guest today, Chef Chris Peer, is one of them. Welcome to episode 65 of the Flavors Unknown podcast. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche, and if you are new to the show, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US, and every other week I interview trending chefs, pastry chefs, and mixologists from around the country. Chef Chris Peer works as an in-home personal chef and culinary instructor. His company is called Perfect Little Bites, and he's based in Fredericks, Maryland. Spear will talk about the pro and the cons of being a private chef, and he will talk about his platform and podcast, Chefs Without Restaurants. Chef Without Restaurants is a resource available to bring independent chefs together. You can find the show notes of this episode and all the other episodes of the podcast Flavors Unknown on the website flavorsunknown.com. Hi, Chef. Uh, welcome to Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you as a guest today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, so we are fellow uh, podcasters. It's really uh, cool you know, to have someone like you. It's, the, in fact, the second time I had like another chef as a guest before that had as well um, a podcast. So um, we're definitely going to uh, chat about uh, podcasting a bit later. So, you know, for our audience that you are based in Frederick, Maryland, and you work as a in-home personal chef and culinary instructor. So um, this is really different from all the different guests that I had before. And that's why I was interested to have you on the show. So can you tell us a little bit more of um, what this uh, job consists of and what's, uh, what's your role? Sure. Well, there's a couple different ways that people do the personal chef thing. I think most commonly, a lot of personal chefs do the in-home weekly meal prep type things. But what I really wanted to focus on is giving people a restaurant experience in their home. So I don't do any meal prep. I don't have like recurring clients. I mean, I definitely have repeat clients. But what I do is I build a customized menu around the preferences of my guests. So I send them a questionnaire, find out what they like and don't like and any diet preferences. And then I show up with everything. I bring my china, all the cooking pots and pans, all the food, and I make everything for them there. And then I go set the table and serve it to them. And we do, you know, a four to six course meal. And it's really similar to going out to a restaurant. Okay. So, and, and you said that this is something that you do um, customized and, and that you have uh, not a lot of um, like repeat customers. So it must be very, it must be like a tough setup and, and business as well because you one of your probably um, pain point is always to look for you know for new customers a hundred percent that's the biggest thing is this week I'm good but next week I'm still struggling as of this point like I have two events and I probably need to get two more and you know you're always hustling every single day just to get another dinner and that is the exhausting part of it. It's not like I have a set thing where I know I'm cooking for three or four families every week. It's just the same as if you were in a restaurant. You don't know from one day to the next what business is going to be like. And so you you attended like, um, you know, culinary school, traditional culinary school, you know, obviously um, uh, early on. So you made a decision, I think, in your career that you didn't want to work at the restaurant, but you you work in, uh, you know, food service companies like, um, you know, Sodexo. So what made you take that decision? A couple things. I think one, culinary school was ridiculously expensive. I went to Johnson & Wales. I got a four-year bachelor's degree and I came out 
with student loan debt remaining of, I had to pay $404 a month for 10 years. That was what I had left after already paying for some. And, you know, I graduated in 98. And when you got out, what the market was looking like is you know, $7 an hour cooking jobs. And, you know, I, I couldn't live on that. But I found a job working in a retirement community and they were offering me eleven fifty an hour, but I also got, you know, two weeks paid vacation, medical benefits, 401k, all that stuff. And it sounded great. So I definitely the finances were a big part of that. But I'd also say just, I never really loved that restaurant experience, the, the, the kitchen life, the working till two in the morning, um, just kind of. I think a lot of the attitudes of the chefs working in restaurants, you know, I applied for jobs out of culinary school and was kind of turned off by the attitude of many of the hiring executive chefs. I just thought these guys sound kind of like jerks and I don't really want to work for them. Huh. Okay. So uh, I had a lot of questions here that comes uh, to my mind. The first one you're talking about, you know, culinary school and how expensive it is. So was it like really worth it? Like going to culinary school? Cause there's like two different I would say school of thoughts where you talk to chefs, you know, there's a group of chefs said, yes, you know, we went to culinary school. This is great for the foundation. It's really built like the starting point of my career. And another school of thoughts is about, no, you know, instead of spending the money and building depth, like the way you just described it, it's a rather, you know, travel, maybe not at the moment, but <laughs> during the pandemic, but, you know, travel and and do a series of, uh, you know, stages in different restaurants and uh, it's uh, worth it. So what's, what's your thoughts on that? I think today I definitely go with the latter. You know, I, I had a great experience at culinary school, but again, you know, I entered culinary school in 1994. We literally didn't even have internet access back then, right? And And while there were cookbooks, they weren't like they are today. You know, today... Every single chef in the world has a cookbook. And if you're self-motivated, you can read through them. You can get on the internet. You can learn so much more. You can watch YouTube. And that, and that's not a replacement for hands-on experience, but coupling that with now the ability to reach out to a chef. You know, I know guys who've gone and staged all over Europe and they just connected with the chef via social media. And next thing you know, they're on a plane and they're working their way through Europe. And that costs a lot less than twenty to $50,000 a year in culinary school. And I think people like that after four years probably have a better foundation than someone coming out of just a, a school experience. Yeah. And you, and you start building your network at, at the same time. And what I'd also say is I think it, uh, if you're going to culinary school at a young age, you don't necessarily know what you want to be doing. I would say get out in the industry and get a taste of things. And once you know what you want to do, you can always go back and take workshops and such. Like, I'm a big fan of that. You know, I took meat cutting as a freshman in culinary school at 18. And then for the next 10 years, I never did any meat fabrication because every place I worked, they were getting pre-cut things. And then, you know, like five or six years ago, there was the big movement to doing more in-house butchering. And I couldn't tell you how to butcher anymore. I hadn't done it in 10 plus years. So I went and took a three-day butchering and charcuterie class. So I would say things like that. Don't go to culinary school, but if you get to the point where you need some butchery skills, you can probably go take a three or four-day workshop, and that would be much less expensive. Okay. So uh, the other point that you you know you mentioned in your decision to work in um, you know company like in food service you know, rather in the restaurants, and you were talking about I would say the attitudes you know from um, a lot of the chefs um, you know back then. So I'm curious about what's the the, the perception that uh, those chefs, you know, that are working in a restaurant have about people, uh, you know, like you working on, um, you know, on uh, food, in food service companies. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of them think we're not real chefs. You know, I've talked about this on my podcast. There's a big uh, imposter syndrome for a number of chefs not working in restaurants. And it, it took me a while to get over that, you know, like people would just say like, oh, it must be nice to work a job where you have every other weekend off or, you know, you, you don't have to work till two in the morning. You know, just like little digs like that. And it hurts a little bit when you're younger. But, you know, it's again like, oh, well, I didn't get divorced because I get to see my wife all the time. Or, you know, my kids kn know what I'm like because we get to spend time as a family. You know, I think a lot of it is just like the jealousy. You know, they could choose to to do it, but for whatever reason, they don't, but maybe are a little envious of, of all the perks that come along with something like that. Yeah, okay. So um, definitely for you, it was uh, 
a part of like the, the decision was as well the the work life balance correct working oh. on those type of um, companies versus working in a restaurant most definitely and my wife went to culinary school too so we also uh, when we you know were first engaged and stuff we were both working in food service and we had different schedules but it was it would have been even more so had i been really working in a restaurant with those kind of hours so at least with me uh, having a, a more stable schedule it was a little better So you have been your own boss, you know, for the past, I'd say, 10 years or so, correct? With the, the company Perfect Little Bites. What's the pro of uh, the setup that you have? So I've been doing it only full time for four years. I did start 10 okay. years ago on the side, but four, four years now I've been my own boss. And I, I really enjoy that, having the flexibility to, to really do whatever I want, you know, on my own terms has been great. I guess the challenge is not having the support of anyone. You know, I don't have a team to work with me. And uh, sometimes you need someone to hold you accountable, I think, is one of the challenges, right? Like, um, uh, now I kind of, because I can make my own schedule and do things at my own pace, that's a benefit, but also a curse sometimes, you know? But I would say being able to really pursue my passion fully, and it allows me to go fast. Like, I don't have to have someone always analyzing every move I'm making. I can just say, this is what I want to do. And I go and I try it and it works great. If it doesn't, I can change it and do something else. Mm -hmm. But So you were talking about, you know, the, the challenge of um, almost, I mean, managing your business like on a weekly basis. So that's, that's probably one of the, you know, the cons correct of the, of that setup, because it's, it, puts a lot of pressure, knowing that there's as well a lot of pressure, you know, for chefs like working at restaurants, but not knowing what's going to be, uh, let's say, the income, you know, in the, the next uh, two to three weeks, it's probably um, a, a tough one to uh, to handle. What are, what are like the other cons that you see, um, you know, uh, working in, uh, in the setup that you have? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about personal chefs is people don't book out as far as catering, you know, with c catering like a wedding or something, you know, people are looking six months to a year out to book a caterer. So you kind of get locked up with the dinner thing. People will just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, it's my wife's anniversary on Friday. Are you free? <laughs> you know, and that gets to be really hard. I would love to have some more lead time, but just it seems to be the nature of what I do that people don't necessarily plan that far out with it. Do you think as well there is um, a challenge when it comes to, um, you know, working with, um, you know, your like your customers, knowing that... Uh, you have to uh, create every time something that is going to be customized and connects with, you know, what they have in mind and their desire. It's probably the idea of uh, of listening, you know, to your customers and I would say sometimes handling their specific desire could be a challenge compared yeah. to a restaurant where you have like, a, you know, a menu set up for like a season maybe. And then, you know, this is what it is and and, and there's nothing else differently. So what I do is I do have master menus for each of the four seasons, and they're really long. Okay. They're Word documents that have literally hundreds of items. And then when someone fills out one of the questionnaires, you know, the first thing I go through and they say, okay, I don't like Mexican or Thai. So I just kind of look through the menu and like cross off everything that's Mexican and Thai. And then they say, you know, I have a nut allergy. So anything that has nuts either gets crossed off or is going to have to be modified. So then that long document becomes much smaller. So I'm not starting 100% from scratch. These are things that are tried and true that I know people love, that I know I can execute in a customer's home rather quickly. And then just over time, I just keep tinkering with it and, and revising it where the menu gets a little better, a little easier. And then having things that you can really modify and say, okay, this is a, a great dish, but if someone's a vegan, this is how I'm going to modify it. Or if they're gluten-free, this is how I'm going to modify it. So a lot of my, a lot of my recipes at their core tend to be vegan and or gluten free, or at least can really be modified so that I don't get thrown for a loop when I have a customer who has diet restrictions like that. Okay. And you where, where is your customer base? This is like, um, you know, around Frederick's where you are, where actually, you live? Actually, no, I live about 45 miles from both Washington, DC and Baltimore. So mm -hmm. being able to hit all those markets. So I say I have a 70 mile travel radius. So I'm on the road a lot. I do a lot more actually in DC and Northern Virginia. And I think a lot of that's just because 
what I'm doing is still so new that even out in the suburbs, people don't even think to look for it. Like in DC, you can hire anyone to do anything. So people will just go on the internet and, you know, in home chef. And, but in Frederick, people are still surprised even after 10 years of doing this. When I tell people, they say, that's a thing. You'll come to my house and cook dinner for me. Whereas in like <laughs> DC and Baltimore, people, you know, it's not a surprise to them. So for, for the people that are listening and uh, maybe, you know, young cooks and uh, that said, oh, there's, there's um, you know, a different, let's say, job like, you know, out there beside working in a restaurant. And uh, what would be your, your advice if someone is uh, looking at, um, you know, starting a business like yours? Well, I'd say you do need to have skills, right? Like, I think that is the challenge is a lot of people want to now come out of culinary skill, school and jump right into this. But you've got to realize, you know, I, I got out of culinary school what, like 24 years ago or something like this. Like I've had a lot of time to refine my craft and do that. And I do think a lot of younger people I see entering into this don't really have the experience to, you know, to back up doing a dinner like this. Like they might be able to do a more casual dinner, but you're, it's going to come at a lower price point. You know, I, I charge a hundred plus dollars a head and it's it's hard to sell customers on that when you've never even really cooked anywhere before you know what i mean but i would say just start trying it you know it is something with very little startup costs that you can just do on the side you know and i would say oh it's your neighbor's birthday like offer to cook for them in their home and see how it goes you know do it for free or do it for cost but figure out what the whole process of like, of like packing up all your China and equipment. And like, even if you're just schlepping it across the street before you start really getting paying customers, start cooking for friends and family and see if you like it. And if it's something you feel you could actually even execute. So we were talking before about, you know, the change of uh, uh, customer acquisition. So how, you know, I'm, I'm guessing one of your, I would task and, and, uh, you know, part of the job, which is probably very important beside, you know, cooking and organizing those events are like, is the, the promotion of it. So how, how do you do that? What are the different channels that you are using beside probably word of mouth, obviously? Yeah. I mean, social media is very important. Again, like I would say to anyone, start building your online presence, you know, get a, a Facebook page and Instagram, a, a website, you know, most of those are free or very inexpensive to do and just start building your portfolio and putting product out there. You know, you do have to pay more in the beginning. I think, you know, like I used a platform Thumbtack, which uh, is like a gig website. So people put on there that they're looking for a personal chef for, you know, this date and this is their budget and you go in and submit a quote, but it costs like 20 to $40 to acquire a customer through that. So it's very expensive, but you might have to get that going the first couple months or years even. I mean, I think I really relied on them for for three years or so, you know, paying for Facebook ads and things like that. Now I can say, thankfully, I don't think I've paid for anything in the past two years where now it's just I rank high on website search. And because I have so many good reviews, people find me through Yelp and everything that I literally haven't had to pay for any kind of marketing in two years now. Oh, wow. Okay, that's really cool. So you're talking about the, um, you know, that you have set up menus per season. So how how do you like rotate and how do you inject, you know, like I would say new new menus, you know, or new uh, like dishes, sorry, on the, you know, on, on the menu, because I, I'm guessing that you are um, regularly adding some like new creation to, to your menus, correct? Yeah, it's whatever is inspiring me. And sometimes it's just a brainstorm, you know, like uh, two weeks ago, I did a Spanish dinner. These people really wanted a Spanish dinner. And I did patatas bravas uh, as one of the dishes, which I love, but I hadn't made it forever. And I made the sauce and I used uh, Katie Button's recipe from her cookbook. And I, I like I taste, I said, wow, this is like the best sauce ever. It's really easy, but it's a really good tomato sauce. And then after the dinner, I just started thinking, like, what else could I do with this? You know, I bet this would be a really great cream of tomato soup base, right? So, like, that's the jumping off point. So, it's like, make the sauce, but then add cream and puree it up. And then maybe serve it with, like, a manchego toast or something. So, it's just sometimes, like, you get this spark, and then you just decide you have to try it. So, then I'll, you know, make it at home a couple times and get it to a point where I'm happy with it. And then it just goes on the menu. And 
Uh, so the menus get bigger and bigger over time. And then I take off items that maybe are challenging to make on site at someone's house or just things I'm tired of making. There's some dishes that people love so much that I now hate making. Like in the fall, I do, I do a squash soup and it's roasted squash and apples and it has uh, a maple cream and candied nuts and, and people love it. But you know, there's some weeks where I have to make it four days in a row and I just like don't want to make it anymore. So, so that, that'll come off, you know, it sounds kind of crazy to take off things that are big sellers, but like, uh, part of why I do what I do is because I wanted the the creative freedom to do new things. And like, if it gets to a point where everyone's ordering the same stuff all the time, I got to find a way to break that cycle a little bit so that I can stay sane. So what's your source of inspirations? Just when, when something really grabs me, you know, I want to make something unique. I've always said that I don't want to have menu items that you can find at any restaurant. Like when someone comes to me and says they want chicken parmesan like i don't want to do that and i think that's the challenge with being a personal chef is people think of you more like a caterer where there's Mm -hmm. a set menu and it's the same traditional stuff you can get at restaurants and i always want my food to be my own spin on things um there's got to be some familiar things or a reference point but uh so for me if i can take something that's somewhat familiar and give it an interesting enough spin that's what i want to do so i just start taking some of those classics or things I really love and trying to make them a little bit more interesting. One of your special dish that you like to make is, you know, shrimp and grits. And I always love uh, to ask, um, you know, my guests coming on the show to share a recipe suggestion or a guideline for um, a recipes for foodies, you know, like myself uh, to make at home. So what, what would be your special spin that you, you put on the shrimp and grits? So going back to like Spanish food, I actually had adapted it where my grits are a manchego grits and then I do the shrimp and then I usually do mine with a tomato based sauce, which used to be like a stewed tomatoes. So going back to like that brava sauce, doing like that on top of the manchego grits with the shrimp and then, you know, quite often I'll use some kind of pork product, which was usually bacon, but putting like crispy Serrano ham on there or something like that. So I'd say that's how I like to kind of cook is just taking something that people are a little more familiar with and then turning it into something a little more interesting. But that dish I've also modified a number of ways. I'll do it as a vegan dish where I'm doing like crispy pan fried tempeh in there or, you know, scallops work really well. Uh, Then I've modified it even more where I'm using uh, a cream of wheat, which sounds kind of weird, but I'll take a farina and cook that up with some cheese and then do scallops on top of that. So what kind yeah. of cheese do you use for that? What kind of what? The cheese. Oh, use. I really like a smoked Gouda or I will smoke my own cheddar cheese. Okay. Wow. Very cool. And when you, you know, you said that you are, you know, organizing those culinary meals, you know, at people's, you know, kitchen and and homes. Do you do everything there or do you do uh, some prep, you know, at your home before and and bring that to, uh, um, you know, the space? So I don't prep at my home at all, but I do have a couple commercial kitchens that I can use as needed. One of the nice things is my church just did a multi-million dollar renovation a couple of years ago. They have a fully licensed commercial kitchen Uh, And then there's a couple kitchens in town here that people rent, you know, for food trucks and catering and things like that. So I have some available as needed. But really, the core of what I do is getting into someone's home and making dinner there for them. So again, trying to figure out menu items that can be executed there. So like, I'm not doing these long, like 48 hour sous vide type things. It's like when I cook a steak, it like goes in a cast iron pan in their home and then that goes in the oven, you know? So you're talking about uh, food trucks. Is this something that you ever consider? No, it's not a part of your uh, model, business model. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to do. But interestingly enough, I moved to Frederick in 2007 and they did not legalize food trucks until I'm going to say 2017. Like we've only had food trucks like three years here in Frederick. They were totally banned. Like you weren't even allowed anywhere in the city with a mobile food truck until like three years ago. So once I realized that wasn't going to be an avenue. So that's kind of where the personal chef thing came from as like, okay, well, if I can't have a food truck, like what's the next thing that I could really focus on? And um, 
would it be something that you could even consider now almost like to expand or maybe to collaborate with, you know, other, other chefs uh, that could be, you know, based in uh, near DC or um, Baltimore? Yeah. So I don't want to have my own anymore at this point. I actually really like the business model I have. I find that it works better for me. I have a lot of friends here who have food trucks and kind of see those challenges. What I would like to do more of is kind of like collaborative events and pop-ups. And these are things I've done in the past with other chefs. So, you know, what if I took over their food truck for a day and, you know, did my food out of their food truck as a, a one-time collaboration? And we had a lot of stuff planned for this year before COVID hit. So that was something I had been looking at, but have done with other food truck operators in the past. Very cool. So talking about collaboration, uh, I mean, you have created this uh, networking group uh, called uh, the Chefs Without Restaurants. So can you um, talk to us, um, you know, about it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just found there were a couple challenges with starting my own business. One was that I didn't really have a roadmap. I had joined the Personal Chefs Association for a year just to kind of figure out how to do some things, but they weren't really focusing on the the way I wanted to work. It was more meal prep. So I just kind of started figuring things out on my own. And once I got successful, I found that a lot of people were approaching me saying, how did you do it? Can you offer any advice? And there were a number of times that I sat down and had, you know, coffees or beers with people and told them the same stories over. And, you know, I wasn't charging like a consulting fee. And I just found that it was very labor intensive for what, you know, what I was doing. And I thought, well, there's got to be an easier way. Like, why don't we just set up like a Facebook group or something where we can share, you know, best practices and resources. And then gig sharing became a big part of it. I found that, you know, I was booked on a Friday night and someone would call me and say, I want a dinner. And I couldn't do it because I'm a one man show. But like, couldn't I share this with someone, this job opportunity? So our network grew to a few more people where we were gig sharing, but it was still wasn't really a, a big thing. Uh, but I love the name Chefs Without Restaurants. It actually came from a dinner that I went to. It was a bunch of chefs who were in between gigs at the time, and they informally called it Chefs Without Restaurants. And I love that. And that was like uh, seven or eight years ago. So I just said, well, I'm going to call this thing Chefs Without Restaurants. And I posted on my private Facebook group. But uh, Laura Hayes, who writes for the Washington, D.C. City paper, saw it. And she said, this is great. Can we like run an article on this, this, you know, Thursday in the city paper. So this was like three days after I just informally announced it on my Facebook, the article went in the city paper. And then we had like 200 people follow our Facebook page by the weekend. And it just blew into this much bigger thing that I had expected way sooner than I had planned. You know, I still had a website that said under construction, I didn't even really know what the group was going to be. Uh, and now I've spent the past three years just kind of modifying it as we go and trying to see where the value is for people and what they wanted to get out of it. And now we have, you know, thousands of members across all social media platforms who engage in, in different ways and are looking for different things. Well, that's cool. And I'm, I'm guessing that this is as well solving one of uh, the challenge that you might have, you know, working on your own, you know, in your business is that uh, aspect of collaboration that was probably missing. Definitely, definitely. That was one of the big things I wanted was to get together and do collaborative events. Events, And I'll uh -huh. say that like here in Frederick, the chef community isn't really open to collaboration. It's kind of every man for himself. And I really didn't like that. You know, I was new to town and I wanted to network with these guys and, and do some events together. And nobody was interested in doing anything. But I found that the people who were running food trucks or were cottage bakers or caterers really craved that sense of community and wanted to do events. So I really wanted to focus on, you know, people who weren't working in restaurants. So I, I'm guessing with the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, obviously those collaboration may, might have dropped. <laughs> but what, what are like the uh, maybe some examples of things that you have done, you know, prior to the pandemic with, you know, through this platform. Yeah. So doing multi-chef events. So, you know, I did one at a brewery not too, too long ago with another chef. They wanted to have a few of us come in and do like their holiday. It was a Valentine's dinner. So we both went and did that. Uh, I did a pop-up takeover at an Airbnb. So there's an Airbnb near us that's really nice. And we just put uh, tickets up on Eventbrite. And it was myself and one other chef. And we did interpretations of each other's food. So he actually has a pizza business and took a couple of my signature dishes and turned them into pizzas. 
for the appetizer part of the evening. And then, you know, he helped me put out a lot of, you know, the plated serve things, but just that idea of getting together with people you really love and cooking with them and serving to a bunch of people. I, I really enjoy that and hope can, uh, we can get back to that soon. Under the same name, then you launch, uh, you know, the, the podcast, uh, Chef Without Restaurants. So tell me, uh, tell me about this. What was the, uh, the idea of, um, behind creating the podcast? Yeah. So actually the guy who has a pizza business, his name's Andrew Wilkinson, and he has this mobile wood fired pizza business here in Frederick. And he helped me on a lot of gigs. Uh, you know, I have no employees, but if I have a party that's like 10 plus people, I sometimes need to hire someone. So that's the benefit of the group is you can just kind of find people if you need someone. And, uh, he had done a couple jobs with me and we were driving back one night from DC and he said, so why aren't you doing a podcast? And I said, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know anything about podcasts. And he said, well, you know, I would love to do a podcast. Do you want to do one together? And I said, sure. So he actually had the idea for it. And the show started last November and he was more of the host than I was. And, uh, I did more of the technical end and it wasn't great in the beginning. The first episodes are a little rough, but uh, we, we got better. We were doing all in person. So we were meeting up at one of the local breweries. So it was only really DC area chefs. But then COVID hit. He had to let go some of his employees just because of he didn't have the business and he didn't really have time for the show. So in March, he stepped back and hasn't oh. come back. But then the benefit for me is then I had to figure out how to do it virtually. And that mm -hmm. opened up the the world for guests, right? So before I'm only doing DC, Baltimore area sure. people, but now I have the opportunity to talk to chefs all over the country and the world. So I've really enjoyed it. But again, that was a big change for me now learning a new platform, how to do it online, but also doing everything myself. Whereas, you know, he was reaching out to a lot of the guests. He did many of the the question writing and asking and you know, I was more of the co-host and now kind of since March moving into the the host role and doing everything. Um, now you discover the behind the scenes, you know, aspect of having a podcast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I love it, you know, and we, we put out 75 shows in a year, which I, is I know. Like it, a it, lot. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, because you do it like once a week, which, you know, I, I cannot do, you know, on top of my regular job. So I, I do every other week. So I, I give you a lot of credit, you know, for that. And so what are like the most important challenges for you um, doing the podcast? Yeah, you know, for me, I just being able to tell someone's story and get it, you know, the, the editing, I think is key, right? You know, you have these conversations with people, some of them, you know, a little bit, some of them you don't know at all. So the researching of someone, you know, I don't ask a lot of questions ahead of time. So really digging into their background, you know, do they have a book I can read? Do they have YouTube videos I can watch? You know, what do I know from interacting on social media and trying to find those really interesting things? Because I want it to be a different take. There's a lot of people who go on like a media tour, you know, there's a chef and they've been on every show and podcast and they really tell the same stories right. and the same thing. So I try and consume a lot of their content to find the thing that I have not heard on another show, you know? Where where can people find your uh, your podcasts? It's everywhere. I mean, the Chefs Without Restaurants. So obviously on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iTunes. Uh, you know, if you have a an Alexa device, you can just ask her to play it. So I've put it everywhere, and we have a couple websites. But the Chefs Without Restaurants dot com website. I have a, a whole podcast tab where in there is every show, and it's got the show notes and uh, the player is embedded in that. So you can also listen to it right on our website. Very cool. Yeah. So looking back at your 70 uh, ish number of uh, episodes that you have done, do you have, you know, a couple that are your favorite? I think the people who I really knew and wanted to dig a little deeper, I'd say Matthew Jennings. Uh, he's always been one of my favorite chefs. You know, I grew up in New England. I ate at his restaurant Farmstead a mm -hmm. lot before he moved to Boston and just someone who I've almost seen as like a mentor, even though I've never worked with him, but just like through his food and we have very similar sensibilities. And then, you know, he closed his restaurant a couple of years ago and then moved to Vermont and now started uh, Full Heart Hospitality, which was kind of a consulting business with, uh, with someone else and now is working 
at a, a healthy foods market doing food like that. So really talking to someone who I consider at the top of their game, you know, someone who's got a cookbook and been nominated for James Beard Awards and was really well regarded that is no longer working in a restaurant and kind of reevaluated his life and what was important, you know, putting family and health first and just stepping out into the out of the industry and doing something different still within food. So I really enjoyed catching up with Matt because I, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And I would say to David Fu was really interesting. You know, he's someone that many of our guests knew from the show Top Chef, but we didn't focus on that at all. It was like a three minute sidebar conversation. His story was more of his parents coming over to the United States from Vietnam, you know, fleeing uh, the country after enduring two wars there and then growing up really poor and how his mom uh, would, you know, go to the market and get chicken bones for free and just boil them and make a very basic broth and they would have it with rice and, you know, kind of living in a, a food desert, not knowing when their next meal was going to be. And hearing that story is really inspiring and, and awesome to hear. And I didn't really know any of that about him prior to coming on the show. So I really enjoyed that one. Very cool. So you're talking about, you know, mentor and people that I inspired you. So what are like the, the three people that uh, you have, that have been the most influential to you? Yeah. So I would say my first uh, executive chef, his name was Ken Haywood, and he gave me a lot more freedom than I think I probably even deserved at the age of 22. You know, I was working for this company and it, it was a contract food service company. And most of those places make you follow recipes pretty rigidly. But I think he saw my talent and skill and uh, found ways for me to, to channel that, whether it be through chef specials or something. So I really appreciate that. And then, you know, he kind of got me ready for my first really like kitchen manager chef role. I'd say this guy, Mike Cavino, he, it's crazy to say that he was someone who was actually a subordinate of mine, but he was the best cook I've ever worked with. He was my sous chef at the last job I was at where I was for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he worked under me, but he had a totally different skill set than me and was just someone who balanced me out really well. So if I had an idea, he was actually the one who had to execute it. So he'd be able to kind of fine tune my ideas and say, well, that sounds great. But like you realize on the line, like we're not going to be able to do it like that. And um, we pushed each other and he actually left the job there about a week after I left. And it's great that he's been able to continue helping me in my own perfect little bites business. So I would say those two are the biggest. And then this guy, Ron Humans, was one of my bosses in Seattle. And he was the first one who got me into a managerial role because that was the first job where I was more behind a desk and had to learn the numbers of things mm -hmm. and figure out how to manage people. And that was the first job where I was hiring people and doing performance evaluation. So I'd say those three people okay. uh, are the ones who mostly impacted me. And, and the last one was in the in food service space, correct? Yeah, it was actually a um, retirement community in Seattle. Okay. okay. I would like to um, finish the, um, you know, our conversation with a, a series of rapid fire questions, if you're okay. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so you said that you are in between Washington DC and and Baltimore. So if uh, you and I would go to um, a little tasting tour, I would say, you know, without the COVID situation, obviously, what are like the the five spots that you would bring me to, and it could be in DC or it could be in Baltimore. Awesome. I would say uh, Clavel in Baltimore for Mexican food. I love what they're doing there. And while we're in Baltimore, I'd also say Eki Ben, which, you know, very casual spot. They do buns, but like getting one of their soft shell crab buns or uh, or their meatball buns are delicious. I would definitely stop there. And I would say, you know, bouncing over to D.C., I love Chai Ko, which is a, a mashup of Chinese and Korean by Scott Druno and Danny Lee. They both have backgrounds in, in more formal fine dining, but have also a casual spot. I would say Ellie in DC is one of one of my favorite spots and the Salt Line is a great more formal sit down kind of restaurant. You know, I gravitate towards a lot more casual spots these days. It's kind of the food that I like. I'd rather go in and be able to get two or three dishes than this big long elaborate tasting menu. Yeah, okay. 
What's your favorite guilty pleasure food? Cheez Its. <laughs> if we're going, for, if we're going for a straight snack, I'll like straight up eat a box of Cheez Its. Yeah, that's addictive. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I love you know, and I love for like meal stuff like tacos. Just like it doesn't even have to be a fancy taco. It could be like just you know a flour tortilla from the grocery store with some ground beef. Okay. What are like the three cool books that inspired you the most in your career? Ooh. So I'm going to start with recently, I would say the food lab, I think is going to go down is probably one of the most important cookbooks. I think technically it's the best book. So I would say that one for sure. Uh, everyone says the flavor Bible. It's a great book, but I would say the first book from them, which is becoming a chef because I was in culinary school and that really was a template to, you know, how, how you can kind of be successful as a chef. So I would say that book there. And then I was really a big fan of Emeril Lagasse. Like he's someone who made me want to go to culinary school. And I really got obsessed with Cajun cooking back when I was young. So his first cookbook, which the name escapes me, but I would say if I had to pick three books, it would be those three. Okay. Beside the classics, um, you know, in terms of condiment spices and sauces, what do you like to have, you know, on hand, on hand at home? I really love a mix of grains and legumes. So I have, you know, probably four or five kinds of dried beans on hand right now. Uh, going back to grits, I actually think I have five kinds of grits right now. I have like a, a white grit and yellow grit. I actually have something called the unicorn grits, which are like a purple, <laughs> like okay. a pinkish, a pinkish color. Uh, but having a good amount of that kind of stuff, farro. So I really like doing grains and beans. So I'd say having those and then pickled stuff. So I'm always pickling something and I always have a jar of pickled something in the fridge. Okay. So where do you get your, your grits from? So, uh, the internet right now, you know, yeah. I love Charleston, South Carolina. My sister-in-law lives down there and, we usually go every year. So I usually stock up and that'll get me through a little while. And then when I run out, she can send me some. So I'll usually pick them up down there. But there's a lot of great other ones out there. There's a War Eagle Mill, which is out of Arkansas, and you can buy them directly from their website. And there's a, a Professor Torbert's Orange Grits, and I just buy them off of Amazon. And those are fantastic as well. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, um, you know, Chef, for uh, sharing all of this, uh, you know, with us. And uh, thank you um, as well for accepting to, uh, and, you know, to be a guest on the show and reaching out to me via in Instagram, in fact. And, we, you know, we, we um, had some conversation through uh, direct messaging <laughs> there. So uh, thank you for being on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I love the show. So I was really excited to be able to come on. Thank you. If you have listened to this far, you are obviously found value in this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Could you do me a favor? I want you to take your phone and think about a person who you know will like it too and share it with him or her. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, just click to the purple circle with the three white dots, click share and send it via text message to someone. If you listen on Spotify, click on the three white dots and scroll down to share and share it as a text message to someone. Thank you so much. Next week, my guest will be Meli Martinez talking about traditional Mexican cuisine with her famous blog, Mexico in My Kitchen, and her recent successful cookbook, the Mexican home kitchen. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.